The following interview was conducted with Clifford L. Swanlund Jr. Clifford for A. Uh, Clifford A. Swanlund Jr. Yeah. for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, October 5, 2007, at the TV studio at Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Good morning and welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. Okay, well, I was born in uh, St. Louis, Missouri, uh, Deaconess Hospital, uh, January 29th, 1932, uh, in the depth of the Depression, <laughs> naturally. So, uh, actually, our home was in Maplewood, which is in, in St. Louis County, which is uh, just outside of Saint, the city of St. Louis. And uh, so I spent, well, my first 18 years of life there in Maplewood, going to Maplewood Richmond Heights Elementary School, Junior High, and then uh, MRH, or the Maplewood Richmond Heights High School. What was high school like, and how large was your was the school and your class when you graduated? Uh, there was six to seven hundred in our school. Uh -huh. I think there was like a hundred and fifty-seven or something in my graduating class. So it was a fairly small school. Sure. And, uh, uh, it was uh, well, very much enjoyable time to go to school. Of course, though, uh, the war was over then, and so going to high school, things got a little bit better than sure. they they had been during earlier years yeah. when, well, first the Depression and then the war years, so. Uh, you have, what siblings you have? Uh, uh, one sister, sister. Uh -huh. who's uh, well, about two and a half years older. Uh-huh. And... Uh, but your father and mother, were they born in the St. Louis area? Or my not? father was born in Aurora, Illinois, and moved to, uh, in 1899, moved to St. Louis in 1903, I think, right before the World's Fair started there, so then all his years were spent there. Uh -huh. My mother was born in uh, in St. Louis, in our St. Louis. So, uh, and uh, they met after he came back from World War One. So, and got married in 1925. Uh -huh. My sister was born in 29, and I in 32. Good. What your father? What sort of work was your father involved? Uh, did he? Well, when you. Well, neither my father and mother really went to high school, and they both, uh, and my dad originally went to rank and trade school and was going to be a carpenter. And then he got involved in, uh, oh, worked for a Huddig Sash and Door Company kind of, and he started getting involved in doing advertising type work. And so then later on, he uh, continued in the advertising business and eventually was advertising manager of Emerson Electric. Good. So, it's a big company. Now it's a big company. Yeah. Uh -huh. And of course, he was there during the war years. So, sure. Uh, but, but it was, they had a good life. Yeah. What was the, during wartime? What was it like there in uh, in St. Louis? Uh, any? Yeah. Do you have ration stamps or? Oh yeah, we had ration stamps and uh, ate all kinds of diff different things that you normally don't think about anymore. But uh, and uh, so so and. Shortages of everything, and sure. uh, gasoline was rationed, tires were rationed, so it was. Uh, but uh, it, it was kind of a there at that war. The, the the country was involved in it, so it was an entirely different situation sure. than been in the last several wars. Yeah, so. I understand. Now it comes to how, how did you happen? Then you came to Purdue, but how did that come about? Tell us a little bit about your experiences and campus life. Well, the the reason I came to Purdue, I guess, I had these friends that lived uh, up the couple doors up the street, and he, and he, uh, uh, Mr. Schindler, Henry Schindler, was a Purdue civil engineering class of 1918, and uh, he was president of a construction, well, steel erection company there, Ben Hur Construction Company, in St. Louis, and they were members of our church and. So I, oh, when I was a junior, senior in high school, was interested in science and math. So, and they brought me up here to Purdue a couple of times to to visit. So, sure. and and their son, Bill. Well, I think he graduated in '47 and got a master's later on, like '50 or '51, and then a PhD, and and ended up. Well, he married a girl that was in my class, and then they moved to California, but. Uh, and then Hank Jr. 
was uh, in the V-12 program in at Purdue. At Purdue, I think graduated in civil engineering in '45, and was became an ensign, and then drowned in a swimming accident in on Saipan Island in about '45 or '46. So. Uh, I, th I think I kind of became a surrogate replacement for Hank, is what it amounted to. Uh -huh. So the, the, very early on, the Schindlers were pushing me <laughs> towards Purdue. Towards boilers, huh? So uh, I think uh, the only question, could I get in, which, which it turns out I did. And, sure. and so I don't think there was any question during my last two years of high school that <laughs> I was going to go to Purdue. So. Right. And it was really very fortuitous that uh, supported the Schindlers to uh, direct me in, the, in this direction in civil sure. engineering. And then during my, oh, the, well, my, between my freshman and sophomore years, I spent the summer at, at Ross Camp. But tell us, yeah, tell us a little bit about what sort of things, when, what did you, were you involved in out there as a student? Well, of course, you had nine weeks of summer surveying camp. All civil engineers had to take this nine weeks of summer surveying camp, so we spent four and a half weeks doing what they call route surveying, up and down hills, laying out highways, and, and then four and a half weeks of topographic surveying. So, so it was a long, <laughs> a long, difficult summer. And uh, that's what was I said. it a requirement? What was it a requirement? Yes. Oh. Yeah. To, to graduate, to graduate in civil engineering, you had to attend the summer. I think they did away with it in. Oh, the 60s sometimes, so it kind of... That's what I understand, in 1960 or thereabouts at yeah, camp, if, yeah, but, uh, from what I've read. Yeah, but it was... Uh, and you stayed out there the whole time? Yeah, the whole nine weeks. Uh, we, there was a barracks there, and uh, we had a swimming pool, which we didn't use much, and then they had a group of ladies that uh, lived out there that uh, cooked all our meals, and that was the one great thing about it. We really... We're well taken care of as far food as... Food was good. <laughs> yeah, the food was good. Uh -huh. So, uh, and our class out there was like 160, and we had one girl, 159 guys and one girl, and she <laughs> she stayed with the cooks. So, but it was almost like being in a barracks in the Army, sure. what it amounted to. Very so, similar. So, yeah. uh, but then, well, I'll get back to where I was then. Yeah. The next two summers, I worked uh, for Ben-Hur Construction Company for... Mr. Schindler, in, in the summers. In St. Louis. In St. Louis, yeah. Mm -hmm. In a oil steel erection warehouse. So all in all, the Schindlers were... <laughs> very helpful. Very helpful. Yeah, good people. What was campus like? And did you, and did you live on campus and were you in a fraternity? Uh, the first or? three years I was in Cary Hall, Cary East. Okay. Uh, right across from the field house, uh, room 120. Uh, and so I spent three years there. And then the last year, they had just built X Hall, which is now Meredith Hall. So we, the last year, we uh, spent in uh, Hall X, which, which was real nice, brand new, better rooms and better facilities than mm -hmm. was Cary Hall. But, mm -hmm. uh, but I spent my whole time at Purdue in the, uh, Were you involved in any uh, clubs and what about athletics or anything like that? Just uh, intramural basketball. Of course, mm -hmm. I played basketball in high school, so it was intramural basketball and mainly. And uh, then American Society of Civil Engineers and eventually got in Chi Epsilon, the National Civil Engineering Honorary, and then Tall Beta Pi, the National Inter Engineering Honorary right. Society. So uh, outside of that, didn't, uh, didn't do much else. What was the, the village like uh, during the time that you were here in the village? Uh, are there many? There were some stores down there, weren't there? Oh, few, maybe. Few, not very many. Not very many. No, it was, was much smaller than what it is now. Yeah, right. Okay. Well, there was like I think eleven thousand students or something when. What uh, was the rate? The ratio was. But, yeah, it was like six to one. With were the, there many women in the civil in the civil engineering? No, not as I said. This one girl was. Uh, there was probably went went a surveying camp, and there may have been two or three, but very wow. few. Quite small. Quite small. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, then after you graduated, well, before you, 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 well, while you were here, became in the went in the advanced ROTC. You might want to tell research what what the advanced ROTC meant. <laughs> well, of course, it, all 
male students were required to take, supposedly take basic ROTC. Uh, of course, a lot of the, most of the athletes didn't take it. You could get out of it if, if you really wanted to, but, uh, but by and large, uh, everybody was supposed to take. Well, as a part of being a land-grant college, they have to provide the ROTC. That was one of the intents of the land-grant college system. So I took uh, basic ROTC. And then the Korean War started in the summer of 50 while I was at the surveying camp. So, uh, and, and then it was your only way of, or it was kind of to your local draft board whether you get drafted or not. It, so it was, you could be in college and you could still get, get drafted depending on what the draft board did. But uh, then after my sophomore year, uh, once I went into advanced ROTC, then, then they wouldn't draft you. You were sure to finish in school. So, uh, well, just about everybody in my class that wasn't a, a veteran took advanced ROTC to be assured of staying in school. So, uh, luckily, the Korean War ended in July of uh, 53, just in, before we graduated. So, essentially, the war was over, but we were still committed to going in the Army for two years. So. Uh -huh. But your, uh, the autobiography that you wrote, you had uh, been done, done some interviewing prior to what, with Shell, was that it? Well, I interviewed a lot of companies. Oh, did you? But by and large, most companies said, uh, well, come back and talk to us after, <laughs> after you're out of the Army, because I knew I was going in the Army early on. Sure. You know, and, uh, after graduation. After graduation. Uh -huh. So, But I did get an offer from Shell in the production department. So. Uh, and actually, the oh, at Easter break uh, in, in spring of '53, I made a trip down to Houston to talk to Shell, and, and so then uh, Shell convinced me to uh, go to work for them for a week in Houston from between the time I graduated and was going in the army, which I did, and it turned out to be I didn't really want to do it, but. My parents and <laughs> Shell convinced me that I really should do that, and it turned out to be. I'm really Worked glad. out well. Yeah, I'm glad they they suggested that I, or, or that I do that, and it turned out well. Sure. Now you you met your uh, your, your your wife at Purdue, or no, no, oh. she, she we we were went to she was in the same high school. Uh, she was a sophomore in my senior year, and and, and I really. In, at the time in school, I really didn't know her that well. Sure. Well, I knew who she was, and she knew who I was, but uh, that was about it. So uh, we really we started dating the summer of '49. Okay. And when you were getting ready to come to Purdue. When I was getting ready to come to Purdue, and of course she had two more years of high school, and, and uh, so uh, we started writing letters. And of course, we did continue to write letters over that four years. So, uh, yeah. and, and she visited uh, campus some, some several times too, didn't she? Oh yes, yeah. yeah. She came to. Well, the war. I think we went to the junior prom, and she came to football games. And, and one of her classmates in high school was coming to Purdue, so she'd stay with her quite often. So she got made that quite a few, well. got a, quite a few trips sure. up here. So, okay. uh, and then. She graduated in uh, 51 and w went to work for Monsanto Chemical Company. So she, in the last two years, we were, she, she was working while I was going to school. Okay. And you got married then and afterwards, right? Yeah, I graduated on May, well, I got commissioned as second lieutenant on May 27th and got my orders. And uh, we, uh, and I graduated on May 31st and I went to, Houston to work for Shell for a week in June 8th or something like that, and then came back and we got married on June 20th, and then left for the Army on July 5th. So, uh, we had a <laughs> busy, uh, yeah, busy month. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. So uh, now, when you then you had to go into service, and uh, you were over in Europe, is that correct? Right, right. We had to spend the first three months at. Uh, uh, in Fort Belvoir in Virginia going to the engineer officer basic course, which was three months, and then we went to, spent three months at Fort Leonard Wood. You had to spend six months on troop duty and everything before they could send you, or before they could send you overseas, so. And then uh, 
luckily I was one of them that got sent to Europe and because uh, just about everybody about 75 percent all the orders came out about 75 percent went to the Far East and only about 25 percent went to Europe so I was one of the very lucky ones that got sent to Europe as opposed to uh, mm -hmm. to the Far East so uh, and you were stationed in as, as you're in Germany Germany in Kitzigan Germany a little town uh, all between Frankfurt and Nuremberg on the main river. So, what were what were uh, what were some of your duties or responsibilities there? Well, I was in a, a engineer combat battalion, and uh, we were uh, well, we we were actually in the 37th engineer combat group, but uh, we were pretty much surrounded where I was in the Harvey Barracks in Kitzigan was uh, surrounded by the first division, the Big Red One. So. Uh, we did a lot of field exercises and everything with them, and then I oh, spent an awful lot of time out in the field with, uh, well, when I got there, there was one other second lieutenant in the battalion, and then he went home shortly after, so for the next oh, five, six months, I was about the only second lieutenant, so I cut all the bad. <laughs> so we, all oh, during the summer, the Russians and East Germans were doing maneuvers just across the border. We were about 50 miles from there, and so we used used to keep, uh, oh, stay out in the field north of the main river with explosives for bridges across the main river. So in case something happened, they figured it happened when they were doing maneuvers. So uh, I spent an awful lot of time out there running around uh, with these explosives and everything uh, to take care of the bridges in case anything happened. Sure. So. Okay. Uh, well, was, it, was it a small town? Did you live, uh, uh, did you have to live on a base there or? Right there was a, we, uh, the was Harvey Barracks was the one where I was located, and so, and just outside, yo, know, just outside the base, there was a bachelor officers' quarters and an officers' club, and so then for the first several months I lived there, and then I was finally able to get Joe over there. So, uh, yeah, you, you explained that in the book. There was a little bit of difficulty to get over there. Right. Yeah. You know, it, it was. Uh, I, I, when I first got there, I didn't think it was possible that she was going to be able to get there, but then they. The government had come up with what they called the Hogue Plant, which was uh, a, a method. What they wanted to trying to do is help the German economy. So they, if you could get certified tourist accommodations in a hotel or something, then they would certify your dependent for travel. So I was able to get that done. And so she got there. Well, I went over in March, and, uh, and then she got there in... Oh, June, about three days after our uh, first anniversary. So, uh, no, we, we really enjoyed Germany. I, I didn't enjoy, and I was gone so much, so it was kind of difficult for her. Sure, but, uh, right. But you were able to do some traveling, though. Together. Oh, yeah. Well, we, we finally got a, well, the first month, or just about a month, we lived in, in this German guest house above the, where they had the parties and everything going on all the time, and a couple of little bitty rooms, and but then we found a German apartment that they weren't supposed to rent to us, but they did because they make a lot more renting to Americans than Germans. So we lived there for, oh, probably two months, I guess. And then we finally got government quarters. And then for the end of the end of the year, we got an old, beautiful, brand new apartment. But but not long after that, we left Germany. So, <laughs> what was your total time over there? A year or? It was about, I, I got there a little over a year. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I got there in March and left in, well, I left in March, so it was about a year. the end of March, so it was a little over a year. Okay. But they came out with an early release, uh, which you, you, you didn't have a choice, so I was originally supposed to come back in June, but but we ended up coming back in, oh, I guess it was April, middle sure. of April before we got back. Okay. But, uh, Were you able to come back together? Oh yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. We came back, came back on the same ship that I went over on. So it was. <laughs> so we, we spent. Uh, it was a troop ship, not. Uh, right. Uh, Her ship was different going over. As yeah, you she went on, over on a dependent ship, which was in June, which was was much better. But uh, so uh, yeah, they. And of course, unless she had a family, could fill a stateroom. They separated so the, they had four wives and one and four <laughs> for their husbands that are in, in, in another state room so so I say every uh, 
every night you're kissing your wife goodnight at the door to her stateroom. So, uh, but uh, an interesting transatlantic trip, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. But mm. we, we really enjoyed our stay in the army. It was good. We got mm -hmm. met a lot of great people and uh, made a lot of contacts and friends. Yeah, and it was a maturing phase. Both of us were very young, and so right. so it was. Uh, it was a good time then. Good time. Yeah. yeah. That brings you back then, uh, your career path. What uh, transpired afterwards, after you got back? Well, uh, of course, I went to work for Shell then. And uh, we went to, well, I reported to Houston, like, well, after I got out of the Army, separated from the Army, we went to St. Louis for three weeks or so. And then, oh, middle of May of 55, reported to Shell in Houston. So, uh, and, and then, in those days, Shell had a training program where everybody spent oh, 12 to 15 months working in various uh, operating organizations and uh, oh, plants and what have you. To I was I have, actually had no knowledge of the oil business when I, when I started. So it was uh, so we worked on drilling rigs and oil fields. Of course, I was in the upstream side, production side. So uh, so we spent a year. Traveling all over you know, Houston, we well, started in Houston, and then Tulsa, Elk City, Oklahoma, and then uh, Duncan, Oklahoma, and Denver, Colorado, Fort Morgan, Colorado, uh, Glendive, Montana, Lake Charles, Louisiana, New Iberia, Louisiana, and then the Houston, they had schools and everything. And then we had a geology school in Austin, so for about 15 months, we moved every four to six weeks to, to a different place, but, uh, but it, was, it was good experience. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Did they, give, uh, they helped you with housing so it was not a problem, or, or was it when, well, when you went to these different cities? Yeah, well, they, you were on expenses until you find a place to live, okay. and so we generally went to a place in a motel that had kitchenettes and things sure. like that. So For uh, that period of time, that would be the best to do. Right, so uh, in some cases we end up renting a house if we're going to be uh, which we did in Duncan, Oklahoma, and Elk City. So it just depends on what, what was available. Right, exactly. And, but uh, no, it was uh, it was good experience. Very, very good. And then, uh, oh, July of '56, we ended up back in Houston to get assigned. So then we were assigned to New Orleans. So and uh, th th then so July of '56, we moved to New Orleans. So. Uh, Tell us a little bit about you. you. Were there for quite a period of time. Yeah, we were you? in New Orleans for eight years, uh -huh. so working for Shell. So, and it was a great place to work for. Shell was a wonderful company to work for, uh, uh, and my experience with them was was just really great. So, mm -hmm. uh, it, it was good. Well, well, we were just getting involved in the offshore business. So, and back in those days, deep water was a hundred feet of water, which. Uh, no, now it's uh, ten thousand feet of water, but uh, so, but it was very good experience, and that's what all we were actually oh designing, building offshore structures. So, uh, so I spent the eight years while in New Orleans doing that, and then in '64 they had some oh gas discoveries offshore Galveston in Texas. So then I was transferred to, to Houston to be project manager on that development offshore Texas. So. Mm -hmm. And then you uh, stayed there. Was it not, you were glad to be back in Texas, or uh, you liked New Orleans? So I from your book, oh yeah, we liked New Orleans, and we figured we'd end, end up back in New Orleans eventually. But oh, I had trouble with one individual that, in Shell that I didn't get along with. Who was the division manager I worked for, and some of the promises they made me when I moved over there, they didn't live up to. So, uh, and I just well, a good friend that. Uh, who had I'd worked with in New Orleans, and he'd gone to work for, uh, well, Jersey Production Research in Tulsa. And then in 1965, they combined Jersey Research with what was Humble Research in Houston to, cook, to form ESO Production Research. So, And uh, they had just made some uh, offshore discoveries in Australia and were trying to build up their organization to look after that. So, I, and this particular individual was then a division manager down at Foreso Production Research. So, uh, but the, uh, 
oh, end of 65, early 66, I started looking around for something else. And uh, he convinced me to go to work for Esso. So then I spent 30 years then working for, well, it was Esso Production Research and then Exxon Production Research. Okay. So. Uh, Did that keep you in Texas or? Uh, oh yeah, oh. I spent the whole in 30 years in there. Uh, in, in Houston or? In Houston, right, mm -hmm. for which was Exxon Production Research. So, but, but I was mainly involved in international offshore design construction. So spent a lot of time in Australia, Malaysia. So that involved travel as well? Well, a lot of travel. Uh -huh. In 30 years, I must have made, oh, 90 overseas trips. So. So, uh, so, so it was real good. Yeah, places have changed though over the, over time, haven't they? Oh yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> so, no, it was turned out it was a really good career move for me. So, of course, Shell was strictly a U.S. company, so you really couldn't get involved in the international. International, because since Shell was totally U.S., well, sometimes you could get involved in some, but it was pretty much limited. Whereas. Uh, Standard of New Jersey, which became Exxon, had a, well, Humble was a domestic affiliate, but uh, we, we were really the engineering arm for the international at uh, Exxon Production Research. So, uh, so from that standpoint, it was, turned out really good. Worked out very well there for you. Right. And you have uh, children, do you? Right. Uh, okay. When, when, uh, when we moved to New Orleans, oh, for the, for the two years we were, or for the time we were in Germany, we were trying to get Joe pregnant, and we moved to New Orleans, and we're trying, and you know, she had an operation, wasn't successful, so we ended up adopting, mm. uh, what, well, Chuck and Judy then while we were in New Orleans. So, uh -huh. uh, Do you have grandchildren? I have, uh, my daughter has three girls. Well, one just turned 16, and now one just turned 14, and the other will shortly return, turn 13. Uh -huh. And then my son has, uh, well, well, she lives in Richmond, just not, oh, not too far from my house, 20 miles from my house. And in then, Texas? In, in, in Texas? Yeah, in uh -huh. Texas, so they're close. And then my son lives in Bryan, College Station, mm -hmm. and uh, he has a, uh, well, a 26, 27-year-old son. Uh, that uh, and then he has a well. She just turned fourteen, a daughter. Okay. So. Uh, well, that's nice. That they're sort of closely keep in touch. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and then I've got a house up on the lake up north of Houston. So it's about halfway to their house. So, I keep and and my son teaches at uh, history at Blinn Junior College. So, uh, and my daughter teaches fourth grade in the school where she is. So oh, how nice. Well, she well, she graduated from UT. Uh huh. Oh, well, that's nice. Um, I know that you've given the, your letters and things to the archives and special collections. For the researchers, you might. How did you happen to come to to write those letters? Just tell us a little bit about them. Well, of course, we were. We appreciate that gift. It's yeah, wonderful. we we were dating the 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 whole four years while I was at Purdue, uh, and so that and we're writing letters during that whole time, and then, oh, like when I was at. Uh, ROTC summer camp and things like that. We were writing letters, so uh, we were, and we just stored them away and you know, kind of uh, what are we, and well after Joe died in April of '02, uh, I was trying to figure out what are we going to do with all these letters and everything. So you knew where they were, even though they've been put away, huh? Yeah, well, yeah, but but some of them had gotten wet and destroyed and. And so back in those days, you really didn't care. And all of a sudden, I, I dug them all out and said, uh, and a, oh, a couple of years ago, uh, Martin and Patty Jiske were at a uh, president consul thing there in Houston. And I, and we had dinner out on Clear Lake on a, on a boat. And I had to ride it from a bus while they had a reception there at NASA. And then we went out. And I was sit, rode on the bus sitting next to Patty Jiske. And I said, I've got all these letters. What do I what do I do with them? Because I I know my kids aren't interested in them. And she said, Well, why don't you think about donating to the library? Of course, she's a former librarian. So <laughs> right. Yeah. So, uh, well, a couple of years ago, they had well this back to class president's council 
here saying they had a deal at the library, so I met Sammy and talked to her and said, you know, would, would you be interested in, in these letters? And she said, oh, we'd love to have them. So uh, then last year, well, I'd kind of gone through and tried to put them together in order in years, that, uh, in, in folders. And so last September, I brought all those letters up here. And there's a bunch of pictures that my dad had taken of old trips to Purdue here and sure. people and things. That going enriches on. the letters, having some photographs. Right. So uh, I, I included that and everything. So. Uh, and you have that nice book that uh, that you shared with me when you, when I met you for right. the first time. Right, and, and then just recently, well, I had a bunch of uh, oh, papers and orders and things from our time in the army and and, and overseas. So I put that together in a in a notebook. I'm going to give that to. And well, there's another smaller one about our life in New Orleans, but there's not as much as many things in that. So very nice. It's a nice collection. So, we're very uh, glad to have it, and it tells a little bit about that era, which is. Kind right, of key. Yeah, the, were there gaps as far as what we have in the in Yeah, the well, that's what uh, Sammy said, you know, that they don't have much in the archives about student life back in the well, right. late 40s. Uh, and that's some of the things that we've been asking in the oral history to kind of share those experiences, which you've done. Right, which so is good. Uh, yeah. those, those letters are kind of interesting. It's fun to go through and read, read them again, and, and things that, you know, <laughs> that happened that you, you totally forget about, and <laughs> no, you go back and read the letters. I had and, no idea. Right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, have you been involved in the uh, Purdue alumni in, in either New Orleans or in uh, Texas at, at all? Well, yeah, I, I've been involved with the Alumni Association there mm -hmm. whenever they have a meeting or something there in Houston. I always go to it. And, of course, and you're I, a member of the President's Council, too? I've been too? a member of the President's Council and a lifetime member of the President's Council for a number of years. Of course, uh -huh. of course Exxon is... Uh, very good. They match any donation I make three for one. So, so uh, I'm a big giver, but it's <laughs> 75 percent Exxon. But, That's very nice. But yeah. it, it, it is very good. And uh, so, well, we even have a, a conference room in the alumni center named after Joe and I. Oh, do you, down there in Dosh, in the alumni the Dosh yeah, building. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, the Swanland. That's a nice facility. I have to go. To, I've I've had a tour, but it's been a while since yeah, I've been down yeah, there. Yeah, well, the Swanland conference room. Is, okay. Very nice. They have that portrait of Amelia Earhart in right. one of the conf the uh, rooms up on the third floor. I'll have to go. And t I have been on the tour, but it's, as I said, it's been a while, so yeah, I'll have to yeah. go and look so, at so it. There's it's a, a wonderful facility. The Swanland Conference Room. Good. I'll have to have a meeting down there. <laughs> <laughs> what else have you been doing in, in your retirement? Tell us a little bit about some of the, your, what you've been involved in. Anything particular? Doing traveling or? Well, um, that, uh, well yeah, I, I, I've after my wife died in uh, April of '02, well, she had a stroke in '87, and, and so uh, and so then. Well, I continued to work. I retired the end of '95, but uh, it, it, it was difficult for her, and we couldn't really travel very much because she was in a wheelchair then for that whole fifty. But we did do some things. Do some things. We even made a trip to uh, Japan and Malaysia, as a matter of fact. So uh, good. But I, we had a lot of good friends that were living in Kuala Lumpur then that took care of her. And, sure. and so I used to make a lot of trips over there. So she, And we go to Hawaii uh, every almost every year. And uh, Well, I originally started going to Hawaii. I, I'd, go, I'd generally be over there in October for oh, school we'd put on and things like that. So we'd generally meet. In, she'd fly out from Houston and we'd meet in Hawaii and spend. So for almost... 25, 30 years, every year we went to Hawaii. So we, we got to the point we really loved Hawaii. And then after, then we even, well, my uh, sister lives in Meadville, Pennsylvania, and after my father died in 75, uh, she moved to Meadville, Pennsylvania to live up there with, with my sister. So uh, we'd go up there and then go on up to Vermont, the Trap Family Lodge, and spend a couple weeks there. So. So, so we got around. Mm -hmm. Kept pretty lot, active. Pretty active, but but I hadn't been back to Purdue though in uh, almost fifty years. And then after, uh, did you come back for one? You had a class reunion. Did you come back for your class reunion? Right. Yeah, the well, 50th. actually, she died in April of uh, of '02. So then, in the fall of '02, I came back for a football game and. 
arranged to meet my had been my roommate for three years who lived in Indianapolis and hadn't seen him in almost 50 years and so uh, it, well and then I also came back in in, in the uh, April of 53 for my 50th class reunion and so then I've been coming back every okay. fall for two or three football games and go visit my sister and and Do you drive from Houston? I drive from okay. Houston. And, okay. But you can take your time. Right. And then, then drive to Pennsylvania and drive back. And then my, my wife has a, has a niece who is almost like a sister to her that lives in Pekin or outside of Peoria, Illinois. And so I go and see her and spend a little time with her. And then Good. she has a, uh, well, her sister had two kids that, and one of them still lives there in St. Louis. And she has two kids. So then I go. And well, her former brother-in-law, well, her sister died oh years and years ago, then remarried. But then I go see them and see this, his You've daughter. Got a good family networking there, Sounds right? Good. So I go see them, and so it, it. So I've been then coming back for two or three football games since uh, since oh two. So. Right. We're hoping this is a big one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Oh. Uh, um, any out, how about an outstanding event in your life? Can something come to mind on that? Is it ask about, or mm -hmm. a uh, long memory, a favorite memory of Purdue? Oh, I, I guess the Purdue beating Notre Dame in <laughs> October seventh of nineteen fifty was, uh, was very that, memorable. Was, was that an upset? Oh yeah, that that was uh, Notre Dame was favored was by it, several. Was it here? Was no, the game no, it was in South Bend. Oh, okay. But Notre Dame was favored by several touchdowns and had won 39 games in a row. So, so they were unbeaten. They, they were, were they were unbeaten for 39 games, and so then Purdue beat them. I think it was 28 to 14. So uh, <laughs> turned out that uh, that Monday after was was an unscheduled holiday at Purdue. I think the first and only time that has ever happened. At Not Purdue. in my career do I remember that. <laughs> no. So. Uh, <laughs> and I guess the most outstanding thing in my life that I was, was really meeting and marrying Joe. She was. Yeah, right. Any questions that uh, that uh, you'd like to ask that were not asked, or any general co summary comments that you'd like to share? No, I don't. Don't think so. Uh, keep pretty busy and uh, keep coming back. And what classes have you signed? What course are you going to take for the back to campus? Well, Those were, programs are, are very good. Very good. You right. Know, right. Well, that's what I say. If it hadn't been for the one about the library a couple sure. of years ago, I, I don't think I would have gotten involved right. with the... Does the President's Council have some things in Texas? Do you get together down there? Right. Or, right. Yeah. They, okay. they have... Well, they had one in January. Uh-huh. They were, they were down... Well, it, it was kind of uh, Martin and Patty's farewell tour. Oh, <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so in January, and that's when I'm, I talked to, to Patty and I'd said I'd you know, left these letters here in the previous September, and I was writing the, kind of the, my personal and family history. And she said, "Well, would you please send me a copy?" So I so I sent Did her. Did you? Good. So I sent her a copy. So she has a copy. Very good. And, and I got a real nice note back from her. Oh yeah, well, she'd be glad to have it. And, and it, it kind of, you know that personal touches. It's it's wonderfully put together. Right. Really, you did you did a good job. And then, uh, well, and then. Uh, the Bearings used to come to Houston. Uh, he loved the astronauts. And <laughs> well, he was in, involved in that early program too. I mean, he, he knew knew quite a few of them. Yeah. So so oh, they would always have a, oh every couple of years have a president's council sure. deal there in Houston and always invite the astronauts or some of the astronauts. Sure. So, right. Uh, we well and they were really wonderful people too. We I don't know if you Jane would take pictures of. Right. Everybody. Right. And so then several days after the... You'd get one. What? You'd get it. She'd send it to you. Yeah. Right? Several days afterwards, we, we did in the mail. There'd be <laughs> copies of the pictures. That, I know. That, She's got quite a collection. Yes. Yeah. I, I can imagine she does. Yeah, she does. And she so, enjoyed that. Yeah. yeah. So... Uh, El, any any closing comments or is anything you'd like to sh uh, say or... Oh, I you know, just that... Uh, El, Purdue was really a great place. and. Uh, I think the education you get at Purdue is uh, just uh, the best, and, and I don't think there's any place. Of course, I get in Texas get a lot, a lot involved with Texas A&M, and I think Purdue is, a, <laughs> from an education standpoint, is far superior. To, of course, most of the Aggies wouldn't agree with me, but uh, <laughs> that's okay. But, yeah. uh, 
And that, so I say, had a, and because of that, had a great career in, in, in the oil business and did, did very well. So without uh, Purdue, and, uh, I, I don't know what would have happened. So, uh, it's very nice. It, yeah. it, it really is a great place and a great place to come back to. It's, right. uh, I, I think it's one of the best colleges anywhere, I, I'm absolutely convinced. So. Uh, very good. Thank. Want to thank you very much for taking time for the interview, and I really appreciate that. Okay. And uh, also sharing the book, so it's very nice. And I thank you.